In our second lesson on nitrogen metabolism from Chapter 18, we'll review nitrogen assimilation. In the previous lesson, we saw that through nitrogen fixation, nitrogen gas is converted into a chemical form, ammonia, that we can use. Now the question is, how do we incorporate this ammonia into biological molecules? Let's first begin with the realization that ammonia it can be toxic to the cells. It's very alkaline, and if we try to stockpile this compound, it will significantly affect the pH of the cell, and that will influence many processes, many proteins and enzymes in the cell. And so we need a way to immediately assimilate this molecule as we absorb it. For this process of initial assimilation, we need the key enzyme glutamine synthetase. Just a note on terminology, throughout this chapter you'll see enzymes referred to sometimes as synthetases and sometimes as synthases. They are both biosynthetic enzymes. The distinction is that a synthetase in the process of its reaction uses a nucleotide triphosphate. Glutamine synthetase is so key that it is found in all organisms. Let's review that process of glutamine synthetase. First, the glutamate amino acid is activated by phosphoryl transfer. A phosphoryl group is transferred from ATP to the carboxyl group of glutamate to form the intermediate, the phosphorylated glutamate. And this is an intermediate as noted by the brackets. We then simply exchange the ammonia group for the phosphoryl group. In other words, we break the phosphoester bond to create an amide bond, and here is our final product, glutamine. The activity of this enzyme is tightly regulated. Glutamine is a carrier of amine groups, as we'll see. Because glutamate and glutamine function so vitally in this process of nitrogen assimilation, they are at higher concentrations than any other of the amino acids. In bacteria and plants, the initial assimilation varies. They also have glutamine synthetase, but in addition they have the enzyme glutamate synthase. Note this is a synthase, not a synthetase. In this process, it will use the glutamine synthetase to convert glutamate to glutamine, but then it can use glutamate synthase to combine alpha-ketoglutarate and glutamine to form two molecules of glutamate. If we sum these two reactions together, the net reaction involves the amination of alpha-ketoglutarate to form one molecule of glutamate. As mammals, we don't have the glutamate synthase enzyme, so we synthesize glutamate in other ways, as we'll see later. Once we've assimilated the nitrogen in the form of an amine group, we can then simply move those amine groups from molecule to molecule to form our other amino acids, and we'll look at this in subsequent lessons. This involves a transamination reaction called this because it involves the transfer of amine groups between molecules. In our figure here, we're transferring the amine group from glutamate, and the amine group is highlighted in green, to the keto acid pyruvate. As you can see, we extract the amine group from glutamate, and that forms the keto acid alpha-ketoglutarate. When we transfer the amine group to pyruvate, we thereby form the amino acid alanine. These transamination reactions are readily reversible, as indicated by the double arrows. In fact, in most cases, the KEQs for these enzymes are very close to 1, meaning that the direction of the formation of the amino acids is influenced solely by the relative concentrations of substrates and products. So by this single transamination reaction, we may form either the amino acid alanine or the amino acid glutamate as the needs of the cell dictate. You'll notice in each case, regardless of the direction of the transaminase reaction, it involves an amino acid and a keto acid pair. 
For this reaction it requires a special cofactor, pyridoxal phosphate, or PLP. So in our next video lesson, we'll look at that transaminase reaction further and see how it functions to move those amine groups, and we'll see the role that that PLP cofactor has in this process.